The Supreme Court prepares crucial decisions for the weeks ahead. We love Obama they don't have the motivation. And Bob Kerry runs to regain his Senate seat in Nebraska. We're here aboard Kerry Express. Yeah. I'm Megan Lieberman, live for the New York Times, and I am joined now by Adam Liptak in Washington to talk more about the Supreme Court. Hey, Megan. Hi, Adam. Uh, so, Adam, we are coming up on a politically charged and busy uh, couple of weeks at the, at the court. Uh, on Thursday, the justices are going to meet about revisiting, potentially, the Citizens United case. So why, why would they revisit this so soon? And they're not likely to actually reverse themselves on this yet, are they? That's all right. So they're, they're coming back at it because the Montana Supreme Court has, in a sense, gone rogue. It has said that uh, Montana's laws uh, can be upheld, even though Citizens United suggests they have to be struck down. Montana has laws that says corporations uh, corporate political speech can be regulated, and uh, it kind of thumbed its nose at the U.S. Supreme Court. So this is really more about smacking down the, the state court than really revisiting the decision. Well, the, the people on the left are hopeful that, uh, that maybe there will be some room for, uh, for new arguments, fresh arguments, or learning from experience. But uh, there's really very little reason to think that five justices in the majority have changed their minds. Right. We're obviously also expecting in the next couple of weeks the decision in the health care case. Uh, after the oral arguments in that case, a lot of people came to believe that they were likely to overturn the individual mandate, if not the whole law. How, how much can you really read into oral arguments in terms of how the court's going to decide? In general, you can read these justices pretty well. And in general, uh, you would think on the evidence of the arguments that the mandate was going down. But this is such an unusual case, and there are so many cross-currents involved, that I think this may be a situation where you don't want to do what you usually do, which is to think you have a very good sense of what's going to happen based on the argument. Right. Um, I know that you've written that pu public opinion doesn't make that much difference to the justices in terms of how they make their decisions. But I do wonder, given how politicized this case is going to be, no matter how they decide, whether poll results like the ones we had last week that show that two-thirds of people or more uh, think that the mandate should be overturned would potentially give the justices some feeling of cover if that was what they decided to do? You know, the justices don't like to say so, but they occasionally speak to this. They don't like to be very far out of step with the American public. And as you say, the poll results suggesting that the mandate in particular, but actually the whole law is pretty unpopular, might give a wavering justice some reason to go in the direction of striking down the law. Particularly since also the poll found that, uh, that the public thinks that their decisions are political. So there's some sensitivity there, maybe. Yeah, that, that's, that's true, too. Um, the, in the wake of the uh, health care decision, the court's approval ratings really dropped. Uh, and this is an institution that generally is very well regarded, but lately has taken a couple of hits. We're also obviously expecting a decision in the Arizona immigration case, another controversial case. Potentially, even if the court upholds that statute, that probably is not the end of it, because it can be challenged on other grounds, can it? Right. That case involves the question of whether the Arizona law conflicts with federal immigration law and policy. That's a different question from, in a way, the more interesting one of on-the-ground application of the law. Is that, uh, does that result in a kind of racial and ethnic profiling? That second question was not before the justices and will remain a live question no matter what the justices do. And I'm curious, uh, Justice Kennedy is often expected to be the deciding voice in a lot of these particularly controversial and close cases. And I wonder, as a court reporter, how much of watching the court these days is really the job of watching Anthony Kennedy? Well, you do watch the whole court, but the reporters in the courtroom, the public in the courtroom, and the other justices, uh, when Anthony Kennedy speaks, everybody perks up and, and pays an extra measure of attention. One last thing uh, before we go. We're expecting a health care decision we know before the end of the term. A lot of people have talked about Monday the 25th. What's your best guess? That's the last scheduled day of the term, but the justices can, and in this case, might well add additional days. So if I were picking a target date, I might go with Thursday, June 28. Very interesting. Thanks, Adam. You bet, Megan. One of the most interesting Senate races this year is out in Nebraska, where Bob Carey is looking to reclaim his seat. All right, we're here. Far away, look. We're here aboard Carey Express. This is Matt Bai of the New York Times Magazine. 
I recently had the opportunity to come along as Bob Carey traveled around Nebraska. We hit about nine cities in our wobbly six-seat plane. He's been living in New York City for the last 10 years, a long way from here in Hastings. And I'd like yeah. to tell you what you could do with some barbed wire and cedar posts that yeah. might come in handy. And are you having fun meeting the voters? I am. Uh, not all of them, but I would say most of them, yes. I would say it, I enjoy it. He's got an uphill climb in trying to reclaim the Senate seat he held until 2001, a time when the U.S. Senate was a much different and less partisan place than it is now. Both sides are sitting inside their caucuses and trying to, and lobbing hand grenades out and trying to figure out how they can gain advantage over the other one. And he's running against a type of politician that didn't even exist in 2001, a Sarah Palin-backed, Tea Party-fueled state senator named Deb Fisher. The clucker growth and, and, and Joe Ricketts got her elected. She's a terrific candidate. I look forward to debating her. And while the latest polls have him down by double digits, it's hard to imagine Bob Kerry won't at least make it a competitive race. If only Nebraskans will remember who he is. So I have to remind them what, the, uh, what my experiences were and how those experiences could affect what I could do if I got elected. And I am joined now by Matt Bai, live from Washington. Hi, Matt. Hey, Megan. How are you? Um, so Bob Kerry's run is so improbable on so many levels. Why do you think he's running? Well, it's not so improbable. <laughs> he was a senator. You know, uh, it's, it's very, I have learned to be very cautious about guessing at the motives and the personal uh, motivations of politicians. They're very, very hard to discern. But I think oftentimes in politics, as in science, Occam's razor applies, and the, 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 the best answer is the simplest answer. I think in Kerry's case, he spent a long time thinking about some of these budgetary issues like debt and entitlements and some of these future of the military issues that are now front and center in Washington. He's 69 years old. He hasn't been there in 10 years. He really wants to have a part in that debate and, and thinks this is a shot, and he was pushed very hard to do it. Yeah, it's always nice to be asked. Um, you know, you talk about how he, the issues he's really cared about, debt, entitlements, are very fashionable to talk about these days, but they are seemingly impossible to actually do anything about in Washington. So I'm curious why he thinks he can succeed there where others have, have failed largely. Yeah, I'm curious too. And it was one of the <laughs> things I, you know, I talked to him about a lot. Look, I think uh, my own sense, I don't know what he would say, is that if Bob Kerry had been in the Senate for another term uh, or had come back to Washington as a lobbyist in the last couple of years, uh, I don't think he necessarily makes this run because I think he would share the sense of futility that people who are here feel, and particularly people on the Hill where the, the culture of the Senate has changed so dramatically. But the fact is he's been away. He has the idea in his mind of, uh, of, of what it was like when he was there. And even though he talks to people a lot and he understands that some things have changed, he still believes he can have an impact. And, you know, there are reasons to think, uh, to think he could if he could get himself elected. Now, as you said, the culture of the place has changed a lot. When he was last there, there were actually a number of sort of independent-minded, if not mavericky, uh, uh, se uh, senators who were not so ideologically locked. Um, it seems to be a much more ideologically polarized place and partisan place. So where does he see himself, where do you see him fitting in the political firmament in Washington at this moment? Yeah, and many of those folks uh, that you mentioned, you know, as I talk about in the piece, were fellow Vietnam veterans like Kerry, and they formed really a caucus unto themselves. And you don't have that increasingly now, where you only have the remnants of it. Uh, but look, here, here, here's what I think, and I, he won't say it, but I think he probably sees it this way too. There is a, uh, a compromise-oriented center in the Senate on these issues. There is the Gang of Six. There are a lot of frustrated senators who want to rally around something. What there is not... Uh, is real, nationally recognizable uh, leadership. And I think what Kerry would bring to this, and maybe the reason he's entitled to some optimism around these issues, is that he is a national figure with real standing. Uh, he has a track record on these issues. He's not going to back down. He doesn't really care what people think. He's not looking to be president anymore. Uh, and I think he would instantly, if nothing else, uh, become a real um, statesman-like leader for that contingent in the Senate, and I think they badly need one. They certainly seem to. Uh, I also wonder how much of this is just purely personal. Uh, in, in 2001, the magazine, the Times Magazine, published a, a pretty famous article by Greg Vistica about a massacre in Vietnam that, that, that Bob Kerry led. Um, and, you know, when you think about this, and you think about this run, how much of this is about potentially personal redemption for him? 
You know, I was really interested in that, Megan, because, uh, you know, frankly, I asked him about this near the end of our trip, and I, really as a sort of aside, it was not the focus of what I was doing there. Sure. We're now talking about a political campaign, less about the war record. Uh, and uh, to my surprise, he really wanted to talk about it, and I thought it was the most poignant part of our conversations, and maybe the most poignant part of the piece I've written is he really... Uh, went on at some length about how this affects his thinking. Uh, you know, Kerry said to me very clearly that this is not a journey of atonement. So he doesn't want it said that he's trying to uh, redeem himself necessarily. But I think he would say that, and did say, that he feels he brings a different perspective than other people and then he might have before because he is somebody uh, who's done some terrible things and somebody who's done some heroic things and thinks about these issues with great moral complexity and that he feels that's something missing from the debate in Washington. Uh, and, and, and I thought that was a very moving uh, 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 part of our conversation when he really went into how tortured he still is uh, over those events and how difficult it's been to, to sort out. Yeah, I thought one of the most interesting things he said to you was that none of us is defined by the worst thing we've ever done. And I guess the implication yeah. being that we're not defined by the best thing we've ever done either. No, I think that's right. And I think, you know, look, that's what makes Bob Kerry interesting to me and to other people. It's what made that generation of politicians interesting. It is to some extent what we miss from the debate. Are people, uh, you know, really thinking philosophically and reflectively rather than reflexively about the political environment. And, and, and it's that kind of sentiment and wrestling with issues and wrestling with uh, morality that I think uh, spurs the, the, the best in politics. And, and it's one of the things that he'll bring to this race, win or lose, that, that I think people will appreciate. One straight politics question. Uh, Nebraska is among the reddest of states. Uh, of course, he is a, a known quantity, and he's running against a, a pretty unknown quantity. Does that actually mean that he has a shot? I think he does have a shot. Uh, you know, I'm not a handicapper. You know, my <laughs> feeling about this, Megan, you and I have talked, is we we're going to find out what happens. I don't try to prognosticate what's going to happen. I don't like to be wrong. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people are writing him off, and I think that's not necessarily the right way to look at it. I mean, yes, it is a highly, you know, a very overwhelmingly Republican state, and we can expect Mitt Romney to take Nebraska rather easily, but uh, it's also a state where independents are far and away the fastest growing voting bloc. Uh, it's a state that has traditionally split its vote, uh, voting in Democrats for Senate, including Kerry, when Republicans have won at the, on, on, the, on, the, on the top part of the ticket. Uh, and, it, and he is facing an opponent who's very untested and unknown in Deb Fisher. She's a state senator. She's new to statewide politics, to federal politics. She'll be having this discussion with a guy who's been you know, immersed in these issues for a very long time and, and experience tells you that in that kind of environment anything can happen. I would be very surprised if at the end of the day this were not uh, a, a, at least a single-digit race, and I expect it's going to be closer than people think it is. Thanks, Matt. Anytime. Nice to talk to you. Before we go, Mitt Romney announced a new bus tour yesterday that will travel through a number of swing states. But Michael Shear noticed a similarity, in name at least, to another bus tour from recent memory. Mitt Romney is calling his upcoming bus trip the Believe in America Every Town Counts Tour. But there's a predecessor. A very similar slogan was also the moniker for a 2004 campaign swing led by Democrats John Kerry and John Edwards. Let's keep moving Wisconsin forward. And the similarities don't end with bus tours. Both President Obama and Scott Walker, the Republican governor of Wisconsin, have prominently used the slogan forward to describe their campaigns. Of course, they would move forward in different directions. Our destiny pack is responsible for the content of this advertising. And super PACs have made the problem even worse. With more and more entities needing more and more names, NPR even created a super PAC name generator. Some don't even make sense. But you never know. With only a limited number of patriotic sounding words, maybe one of these slogans will be emblazoned on a swing state bus very soon. That's all for today. Stay with us online for more on Campaign 2012. I'm Megan Lieberman. Thanks for watching.